Now, it's time for me to hand you over to our speaker for this evening. He is a professor of philosophy, the founder of the New College of the Humanities, and author of over 30 books on philosophy, biography, and history of ideas. Please give a warm welcome to Professor A.C. Grayling. Thank you very much, Faye. That's very kind. Thank you. Right, so um, my theme tonight is about a very, very striking fact and the implications of that fact. I want to talk about both those things, if I may. I'll come to the implications in a bit because they're interesting and perhaps significant. The striking fact is that very recently there's been an enormous explosion of knowledge in science, in history, in thinking about the brain and the mind, very, very recently indeed. I mean, only consider it's just in the last few decades, really, that we've been able to look at the brain actually at work using uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging to see the brain at work when it's challenged with uh, questions, tasks, asked to remember things, uh, to feel things. And that is a very remarkable advance. And it is one which has a lot of applications. So when we think, for example, about um, the, the clinical interest that attaches to knowing which bits of the brain are associated with which kinds of cognitive functions and psychological phenomena, uh, then thinking about how to repair or to deal with injuries and disease of the brain um, becomes much, much more accessible. So that's a really remarkable thing that's happened. And as I say, it is just a matter of the last two or three decades that huge amounts of progress have been made in that. It's just in the course of the last century or so that an immense amount of knowledge has been accumulated in physics, in fundamental physics, particle physics, thinking about the microstructure of matter, and in cosmology, thinking about the universe as a whole. I mean, if you consider the fact that it was just in 1897 that J.J. Thomson uh, detected the electron, this little negatively charged uh, particle with less mass than the atom as a whole, and it was less than 50 years after that that the atom bomb was exploded over Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So the uh, degree of knowledge that was uh, uh, accumulated about the, the structure of the atom, I mean, if you think of Max uh, Planck's um, idea of the quantum, which was just a, a heuristic, was advanced only in 1900. And then Einstein in his wonderful year of 1906, one of his papers on the photoelectric effect made use of, of that idea. In the early 1920s, quantum theory was formulated by Heisenberg and others. In fact, it was given a kind of official welcome, if you, if you like, at the famous um, Solvay conference of 1927. The nucleus of the atom was uh, finally the structure of it was finally identified in the early 1930s and within a few years, how to split it, how to uh, release all the huge amounts of energy contained in that tiny little bit of mass uh, that had been arrived at. So the, the, this is amazing. And then the standard model of the atom, which was just completed nine years ago in 2012, when the Higgs boson was uh, identified at CERN, in, in Geneva, the Large Hadron Collider. That completed a model which had more or less reached its uh, final stages back in the 1970s, but needed that discovery to finish it off. But we're still talking about very, very recent times. This is just the last hundred years that we're thinking about here. And also in cosmology, it's extraordinary to think that it was in the 1920s only that the observations made by Edwin Hubble showed or confirmed anyway what had just begun to be suspected that our Milky Way galaxy is not the entire universe but just one galaxy among billions of galaxies in the universe and also that the universe is expanding which of course entails that it started from a much much uh, a smaller point indeed perhaps a singularity hence the Big Bang theory about the origin of the universe. It was in 1929 that Hubble made that observation about the expanding universe. So these are very, very recent advances. The same is true of history. Until the second half of the 19th century, the stretch of history more or less went back just to about 1000 BCE, back to the period that was more or less uh, spoken about in uh, the Hebrew Bible, what Christians call the Old Testament uh, and in Herodotus. Really history after the what's now called the Bronze Age collapse, which happened at about 1200 uh, BCE. But before then, there were at least 3000 years of 
history of civilization, reaching back to Sumer and Akkad and the earlier uh, Babylonian civilization. And all that was only discovered by the archeology span of the 19th century, especially second half of the 19th century and uh, in the 20th century. So expanding um, the history of uh, civilizations by double the length of time that had been known by the middle of the 19th century. And then of course, the discoveries in paleoanthropology, the history of humankind, stretching back hundreds of thousands, indeed millions of years, all the way back to where the hominid line split from the, the parents, chimpanzees and others about 6 million years ago. So this extension of our thought and, and uh, investigation back so far in time, this new quantity of knowledge about the universe from the smaller scale to the larger scale, and then this new set of discoveries about the brain and the mind, all so recent. And in fact, I can dramatize this a bit by, by mentioning that, that when I was born, my father was 40 years of age. And when he was born, his father was 40 years of age. And uh, if you add up um, th th those two numbers uh, and my own, a bit like uh, Jack Benny, I suppose I should claim to be 39 years of age. But at any rate, if you do the arithmetic, it turns out that my grandfather was at school in the 1870s and 1880s, which is a remarkable thought. But even more remarkable is the fact that when he was at school at that time, none of this was known. None of it was known. So it is all extremely recent and it's been exponential, the sheer volume of new knowledge that we've acquired. But here's the thing, that all this new knowledge has taught us something very surprising. It used to be thought that the more we knew, the less we were ignorant of that research, inquiry, discovery diminished the realm of ignorance, the realm of the unknown. And until this very recent burst in uh, the discovery, people really thought that they were approaching the truth about things and getting a handle on how things really are in our universe and in the past and getting a much better understanding of ourselves. And yet what all this discovery of these very recent times has shown us is that the realm of our ignorance, the, the great landscapes of the unknown are immensely vaster than we thought. Just take one consideration. All that development in the natural sciences has shown us that we only have access to 5%, actually less, 4.9% of the mass of the universe. Whatever makes up the, the total mass of the universe, only 4.9% of it is accessible to us. That's how little we really know of what there actually is and what the universe is really like. Everything else, the other 95%, consists of dark matter and dark energy. Indirectly, um, cosmologists know that there has to be something which is causing gravitational effects on the galaxies, but we can't see it, we can't detect it. And there must be something which is pushing the universe apart, expanding it at an ever increasing rate. You know, from about halfway through the life of the universe, uh, the universe has been expanding more and more quickly. And this is the, where the hypothesis of dark energy pushing the universe apart comes in. And between them, dark matter and dark energy constitute about 95% or just over of the mass density of the universe. So it is pretty extraordinary that all these discoveries and all, all, the, all the applications that these discoveries have made possible, when you think via technology, indeed the very technology that we're using at this moment, come out of what we've discovered about that 5% of the universe. And yet the, the, the great unknown is even greater than we thought. It's a bit like this. You just imagine occupying an island which is growing in the ocean. As the island grows, that's as our knowledge grows, so the shoreline becomes longer and longer. That is to say, so the landscape of, of, of the unknown, of what we're ignorant of, becomes larger and larger. So there is a, a, a paradox, which just by itself is interesting enough, I suppose, although now that we live as we do in such a technologized age that we're, we've become rather used to it, or we don't really think about it, it's just the wallpaper of our thought. But, but here's another consideration which should be very surprising. In the um, long, long period when our ancestors thought that their inquiries were diminishing 
in the domain of the unknown, the aim that was uh, before them was achieving certainty, achieving knowledge, truth, really knowing how things are. But with this paradoxical situation we're in now, we find that it's no longer a question of seeking for certainty, but of trying to make sense of the increasing domain of, of the unknown through the best endeavors of inquiry in a way which makes the actual nature of inquiry rather different. Let me see if I can explain that uh, as follows. I know you were all reading uh, Descartes in bed last night, so you will remember his uh, effort was to try to show that we have something that we can be certain of. And you remember he said that, well, I cannot be, I cannot doubt for a moment that I exist because I'm thinking cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am. So I can be certain about that. Now, what else can I be certain of? Can I build certainty on the basis of this thing that I, that I simply cannot doubt? So his quest was for certainty. And the model of knowledge that he therefore had in mind was the, the kind of thing that you have if you have a, a big faith commitment, if you think that um, absolute and final truths are available, perhaps through revelation or uh, intuition, then that is the model that you have of the nature of knowledge. But scientific inquiry finds that as it develops, as it discovers more things, so more and more questions arise. So there are new problems to be solved. So there are new things to be investigated, that each discovery actually proliferates more things that need to be examined. The open-endedness, the uncertainty of knowledge, the fact that instead of reaching for something which is going to be final and absolute, what we're doing is we are um, managing the, the, the very best understanding that we can of the phenomena that we're investigating, and then finding that that opens up new landscapes. A bit like climbing a mountain and finding each time you get to what you think is the summit that there are further summits. And when you reach those, there are yet further summits. And that is how we've discovered uh, the nature of knowledge to be, the nature of inquiry. And this therefore changes the game. It changes how we think about inquiry. So in Descartes' time and in that whole tradition of, of thinking about knowledge and inquiry, it was thought that what you had to do was you had to refute skeptical challenges which call into question the possibility of having certain knowledge. Might I be dreaming now? Might I be deluded? That was the, uh, the heuristic device that Descartes used. He said, well, if I'm going to be absolutely certain of something even so simple as that one plus one equals two, I have to be quite sure that there isn't an evil demon who's tricking me into thinking that one plus one equals two. And that was the problem that he set himself. But now the problem of inquiry is very different. We don't because we're not any longer thinking that we're gonna get certainty, but instead that we are going to get the best theories we can arrive at. We're looking at uh, the nature of, of inquiry in a very different way. We're looking for what we can best describe as the most powerfully supported theories that we can devise under the government of a principle of defeasibility. Defeasibility is a nice word. It means that you have to be open to the possibility that new evidence might come along and change your mind, or that new and better arguments might come along, which will make you interpret, reinterpret the data that you have. That there is something intrinsically uh, open-ended uh, about our thinking about the world. And that therefore what we mean by knowledge is not absolutely rock solid, hard, fast fact, but is something that you can rely on for just so long as it is supported by the evidence, because our uh, theories are always going to be defeasible. And that means that the, the kinds of challenges that we meet with in inquiry are challenges like this, we have to accept that we uh, are observing the universe, that we are investigating past time, that we are thinking about ourselves from a very, very limited and localized point uh, in, in space and in time um, with very finite powers of investigation. It's as if we're looking at the universe through a little pinhole at a certain scale. After all, we are 
a little bit over halfway between the very smallest length we can currently think of, the Planck length, and the very largest, which is the diameter of the visible universe. And we are just a bit more uh, than halfway between those two lengths. But we have to ask ourselves the question, are those two limits of the smallest and the largest just a function of what at the moment we're able to reach? Maybe they aren't the actual smallest or largest. Maybe this is just a function of our limitations. And we're looking at these uh, um, phenomena of, of nature at the micro level, at the, at the mega level, uh, using our very limited powers. We extend our powers, of course, by using instruments like telescopes and microscopes and oscilloscopes and so on. But even they ultimately have reference back to us and to our ability to understand things. So just one example of the kind of puzzle that that raises. As you know, there is a major difficulty about reconciling quantum theory, which just is the theory used to uh, talk about the very small. It's a very powerful, very, very precise theory. I mean, just how precise it is, uh, is illustrated by the remark that um, uh, uh, Richard Feynman made, that if you asked uh, what the distance is between you and the moon, you could say, well, do you mean the distance from the top of my head to the moon or the distance from my feet to the moon? And that is how precise the measurements would be using uh, the, the, that theory. But it cannot be reconciled with uh, general relativity, with the description of the uh, way that space, uh, time and its curvature accounts for gravity and acceleration. So this kind of, of, of puzzle the fact that we find quantum phenomena, you all know that stuff about the Schrodinger's cat being both dead and alive. I mean, the, the, the seeming weirdness of, of the quantum um, level means that we can't interpret it easily in our ordinary experience, in what's sometimes called the classical worldview. And what does this tell us therefore uh, about the relationship between the very best theories we have about the microstructure of the universe and our abilities to inquire into it and understand it and grasp it. Well, what it does tell us is that we are trying to get to this understanding from this limited and finite point of view. And so the challenges we have are no longer the kinds of challenges that Descartes have refuting the skeptic, but instead there are challenges about how we best apply the techniques of inquiry to overcome that problem, the problem of our limited position, but also other problems too, like all our theories about uh, things are going to be like maps and the relationship between a map and a country. You may have come across that story by Borges in which he talks about the perfect map being the same size as the country of which it is a map. So it perfectly registered all the details of that country. Well, obviously a map as big as the country would be useless. Your map needs to be small. Uh, the scale and the relationship between the map and the country has to be such that much is left out. Now, all our theories are like maps of the phenomena. We also, in order to try to help ourselves understand things, use metaphors. I cited the example of the cat, which is both dead and alive in the Schrodinger uh, experiment to explain superposition of quantum states. Well, that's a, a metaphor, an illustration, an example. And we have always to be very careful about the metaphors we use when we try to understand things. I mean, if you think about all the way through history, how uh, back in the beginning of the modern period in the 16th, 17th centuries, people used the metaphor of clockwork to explain how the universe functions. And um, when space travel began in the 1950s, somebody came up with the idea that gods might have been astronauts who visited our planet from outer space. And another metaphor, another something suggested by what happened to be you know, in the air at the time. We now use the um, metaphor of the computer for the brain. And uh, some of you may have come across the arguments uh, put forward by Roger Penrose and others to the effect that mental uh, that brain activity should not be modeled on computation because it actually has a different character uh, according to them. So once again, the question of the metaphors we use, the question of the relationship of the, the map to the terrain, th these are questions which now face us new kinds of challenges to inquiry. Also, you know that saying, if your instrument is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. You use mathematics. Mathematics is the hammer used in the natural sciences. Is that 
tool, that intellectual tool, shaping and, and configuring the way the world seems, um, but leaving something out or making us miss something. And what about the so-called lamplight problem? This is that, you know, when you lose your keys at night, the only place you can look for them is under the lamplight, because that's the only place where you can see. Think about the inquiry into human history in paleoanthropology, digging up human and hominin and hominid fossils in places where they're most likely to be found, like in East Africa or in the Joko Dien caves in, in China. That's looking under the lamplight. It's so much else of the surface of the earth where there might be evidence, but we, we can't see it because we don't have access to it. And so on and so on. So these, these are all different new kinds of challenges that this open-ended sort of inquiry in the face of the much, much larger terrain of the unknown that our discoveries have revealed to us. So having uh, dilated on, on, on that point and, uh, and uh, illustrated, I hope, um, how this massive increase of knowledge has also been a massive increase in the unknown and posed a whole lot of new kinds of, of uh, um, demands on us as we research, inquire, discover, think about the world around us and about ourselves. What are the implications of that? Well, I think one of the most important implications uh, of it is that this way of inquiring, these sorts of um, problems that need to be overcome in order to build theories which are really, really well supported, even though they are defeasible, requires of us that we think about how we educate and what we're educating for. And, and there are two aspects to this. One concerns the very general question of how literate we are as a society in all these different fields. The idea of, of having scientific literacy, not expertise, don't have to be a physicist or, or a chemist or a biologist uh, to be involved, but to be literate, to have a, an intelligent um, and sound overview of what's happening in all the major areas of science so that one can understand when one reads in the uh, newspapers or, or watches a documentary on television, one really has a, a, a good understanding of what's going on. And the importance of that, of course, is that we are, all of us, going to have to take part in conversations about public policy on the applications of science. Let me give you an example. At this very moment, and indeed for at least the last couple of decades, Hundreds of billions of dollars have been invested by all the major military nations of the world, the US, China, the United States, France, the UK, in autonomous weapon systems uh, operated by AI. So they're not operated by human beings, they're programmed and set going, but they're actually operated by uh, art of artificial intelligence systems on board. So this, these weapon systems may be in the air, uh, on land, under the sea. Now this use of, of AI technology uh, in weapons technology may have some advantages. The weapons may be much more precise and accurate. Uh, they, may, they don't involve any of our own personnel, so they solve the body bag problem. Um, they also are unemotional. They don't feel fear or anger or hatred for the enemy. So they might be very efficient in that kind of way. But on the other hand, the idea that there would be autonomous weapon systems, they're actually, by the way, called lethal autonomous weapon systems, L-A-W-S, laws, which is a rather chilling acronym for them. But this is something which is actually in development at this very moment, and it's an application of uh, all this new knowledge we have, all the new science, which has led to these very dramatic technological developments. Wonderful in one way and in another way, very troubling. But we all need to be literate about it. We need to know about these things and understand them, have some sense of how they work. This really is an iteration of the point. And uh, many of you will remember uh, C.P. Snow uh, back in um, the 1960s had argued that the widening division between the sciences on the one hand and the arts and the humanities on the other hand was resulting in the fact that the the two sides of the argument, and especially from the arts humanities side, really not understanding the implications of what was happening on the science side. Particularly worrying, given that most politicians and most civil servants tend to be on the 
arts and humanities side of things. That's what they graduated from. And therefore, their insight into and their understanding of the implications of what's happening with technology and, and the sciences is not quite what it might be. Hence the importance of a more general kind of literacy. Again, as I say, you don't have to be an expert in these things, but to have an intelligent understanding of them is tremendously important. And that is something which we've lost. And we've lost it because we've been thinking about education in a very different way. Two points here are of importance. The first is, we are all of us very familiar with the cliche expression, critical thinking. It's such a cliche that people bandy it about and, and they don't really think of just how incredibly important it is. And to illustrate just how important it is, consider this. When the internet became publicly and widely available from the uh, 1990s, we all thought that this was going to be marvelous, a great agora, a great marketplace of conversation, ideas, opinions, a sort of democracy uh, where everybody could participate and have their say. Well, it's turned, uh, of course, as we're all too familiar, into an absolutely horrible lavatory wall on which people scribble all their rubbish and graffiti and racism and hate speech and falsehoods and their stupid um, opinions and so forth. Uh, and in order to find the good stuff which is on the internet, all the information that we can get hold of, we have to be very good at knowing how to find it, how to evaluate it, how to be critical about what we meet with there. So this idea of critical thinking is not just, it's not just a cliche kind of thought, it really is a crucial thought. You know, given that you can get almost anything in, in the way of information from the internet uh, in, embedded in all this nonsense which is there as well, it is of the first importance that the focus of what we do when we educate ourselves and our, our pupils and students is on this business of evaluating and critically uh, and thinking about what we meet out there. And in order to do that in turn, we have to have this general background literacy, which helps us to put things into context and to make sense of them. Now, it used to be the case, and we go back now to when my grandfather and his, his predecessors were in education, that education was general, and then people specialized afterwards. A little bit like uh, what, what is just about still the prevailing model in the United States where you might do a liberal arts degree and then go on to graduate school to do law or medicine or, or to specialize in something. So the idea of having a, a broad general education, broad general literacy across the different fields of inquiry and then specializing in one provides this rather good basis for being even better at your specialism than you might otherwise be. But now think of education in our country. After the age of 16, people focus down on might be three A-levels. Then they go to university and study one subject. So they've begun to specialize very, very early. And we leave up to them their general education after their formal education is over, if they're interested enough to read and to find out and to become literate across the board. We've reversed it. Uh, and we've reversed it because uh, education has become a way of providing foot soldiers for the economic battle, for getting people jobs, for fitting them for careers, for making them sufficiently literate and numerate in ways that you know, serve the economy. And of course, that's important. I'm not for one moment saying that that shouldn't be the case. But it is equally important that people who are not just their careers, they are also voters and thinkers and lovers and parents and friends and travelers and neighbors. They should also have this much, much broader literacy, conscious of the fact that the world is not a fabric of facts which have been settled and agreed and, and put in place by the discoveries to date, but is an open-ended uh, field where all our inquiries are generating new questions to ask uh, new answers to be sought. And, and that realizing this is not just fascinating in itself and, and very enriching, but also very important from the point of view of how we decide how we as a society and how we as individuals are going to live, how we're going to vote, what choices we're going to make about what we do with what we currently think we know. So the, these implications, uh, it seems to me, of this 
very paradoxical situation, huge extension of knowledge with an even greater extension of, of our understanding of what we don't know, changing the way we think uh, about research and discovery, changing the way therefore we think or should think about education, making different demands of us, demanding of us that we be much more generally literate than most of us tend to be. Of course, I'm referring to people who, do, who don't attend Intelligence Squared talks because I, I, I take it that but one of the premises of doing so, of course, is just an interest in being literate in that general kind of way. So, so that, that is pretty well the, the uh, argument of the book. But I, I also wanted in the course of the book, not merely to, to say these things, but to show them, because to, to demonstrate uh, that uh, it is possible to have this kind of overview of what we currently know in the natural sciences, in history and paleoanthropology, and also in discoveries uh, about the brain and the mind. And how these questions about inquiry, how these new challenges about inquiry uh, can be met uh, or put to work in our further thinking. I wanted to show this. I also wanted to show where the frontiers of knowledge were and, and how they reached where they are now. Talking a bit therefore about the history of development of thinking about these things, because that puts it in context also. So the, the book both uh, presents this paradox, the paradox of knowledge, increasing the quantum of, of, our, uh, of our ignorance, but an interesting and a valuable ignorance. And let me illustrate that just with two final points. A very good uh, friend of mine is a senior scientist at CERN. Uh, in fact, he was one of the leaders of the compact muon solenoid experiment. That's one of the two experiments that were looking for the Higgs boson um, to Jim Devadi. He was knighted for his work on, on the Higgs project. And when, when the um, announcement was made about the discovery of, of the Higgs field in 2012, he uh, and his colleagues, of course, were present at the announcement. It was made public and it was on television and it was all very exciting. I got to the front page of newspapers. And afterwards I said to him, it must have been absolutely wonderful to be able to announce this after all these years, the immense expense of billions of dollars have been invested in this tremendous experiment, perhaps the greatest scientific experiment that had ever really been conducted by humankind. And he said, yes, yes, it, it was great. It was absolutely wonderful. But if we hadn't discovered the Higgs boson, that would have meant that there's a whole lot more physics that needed to be done. Now that attitude, the attitude of, of being, of welcoming uh, new mysteries, new problems, of feeling a relish in the nature of, of, of the challenge that that poses, I think is absolutely marvelous. It's the very best thing about the human mind, wanting to find out more, wanting to go further, wanting to go dig deeper and, and try to make better sense of things. That is a remarkable feature of the, the, the very best of inquiry. And of course, it reminds me of what the French poet Paul Valéry said. Uh, you may remember he said, a difficulty is a light, but an insurmountable difficulty is the sun. Because our effort to try to chip away at it, to, to dig at it, to, to make some sense of it, to try to find some way around that problem is so illuminating that we learn an enormous amount more as we do it. And so the, 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 in, in one way, the fact that all our discoveries have opened even greater vistas uh, of the unknown, of what we need to inquire into, these greater mysteries, that 95% of the universe we don't have any access to at the moment, that is exciting. And it offers really, really interesting demands on us to try to think of ways of finding out more about it. But let me leave you then with this final thought also about why knowing about these things and taking an interest in these things matters. In this um, uh, connection, think about what's happening in neuroscience. At this moment, we are right on the horizon, on the imminent horizon, of seeing uh, medical technologies developing, which involve interfaces between the human brain and computer chips, actually implanting chips into the brain to do things like 
controlling Parkinson's disease or epilepsy, or perhaps uh, helping to deal with um, very, very serious depression, mood control, perhaps also helping to um, get rid of very deeply troubling memories, which cause post-traumatic stress. So the, these are technologies which are, are, are very close. I mean, there, of course, there are other ways, there's surgery, there's pharmacology, drugs, but, but these uh, brain chip interface technologies are very, 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 very near on the horizon. In fact, if you go on the website of DARPA, which is the, um, the Defense Department uh, Research and Procurement Agency of the United States government, you will be astonished uh, at all the projects they are funding now, including projects of this kind, brain uh, chip interface projects. Now, this is wonderful. The clinical applications are very, very positive. But this same technology can also have malign uses. Think about mood control or the wiping out of memories or the, maybe the implanting of memories or the control of behavior. Um, th th these things are not beyond the boundaries of possibility. And there is a risk always that when new technological possibilities come into view, like for example, autonomous weapon systems and like these uh, brain chip uh, interfaces, when they come into view, efforts will be made to make them happen. There is a kind of law which says, if something can be done, it will be done, despite all our best efforts to stop it. If it can be done, it will be done because it will bring advantage to somebody, either a government, a country, or a private industry, or a private agency who can afford to do it. And therefore, we need to be very literate about these things. We need to know about these developments because we are all of us, at some point, going to be party to the conversation about whether or not we want them or the conversation about how we're to manage them. And for that reason too, therefore, we need to be conscious of the fact that uh, this general kind of literacy is uh, important and that therefore we should both inform ourselves and make sure that our formal education process really equips people to be good at thinking about these things. So that's, uh, that, that's the, um, the argument, the fact that uh, we have this great paradox of knowledge now in all our wonderful new discoveries, uh, and that has these implications for us, how we're to think about it and how we're to manage it. Back to you, Faye. Thank you very much for that amazing lecture. I'm sure we can all agree that we've really started to think about how we think and the different areas in which knowledge is a question. And coming on to questions, we have a lot of questions from the audience. First of all, we have a question from Rhys Jaffs and he asks, has your view on the importance of public scientific literacy changed through the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, no, actually, th this is uh, something which has been a, a, a bee in my bonnet for, for quite a long time. Um, uh, not being a, a scientist myself, but being intensely interested in what the, the, the different sciences um, ha have been up to. I mean, just during the course of my own lifetime, there have been extraordinary discoveries. Think, for example, of the publication back in 1990 uh, of the um, uh, COBE uh, uh, examination of the microwave background radiation in the universe, which is a signature of the Big Bang. I mean, it's quite extraordinary, really, to, to find that we can that, that we can detect the, the, the what, what's left over from that event. 13.72 uh, billion years ago. That's really extraordinary. And that's just one small example, not one small example, but one quite big example of really remarkable things that have happened uh, in the sciences. And I'm sure that scientific development is going to find an earphone that will stay in pretty soon too. Fingers crossed. We also have a question, this one's quite interesting. Is humanity sometimes guilty of prioritizing the wrong areas of knowledge? e.g. should exploration of the universe take a back seat until we do more to solve problems on Earth? Well, my, my view is that, uh, the, you know, this is not a zero sum game. Uh, after all, there are people with different talents and interests and capacities working at different, um, you know, faces of, of the uh, inquiry um, region. And it so often happens that things that we discover in one domain turn out to have applications in or implications for another domain. So we shouldn't shut down inquiry 
uh, anywhere. We should be working away on all fronts because it, you, you never know. We may really discover something um, of great importance in some given front that really changed things. And as I say, there could be applications and implications also for others. So we should just keep going right across the board. So on that note, do you think there are limits perhaps to what we can discover? This is a question from Mark Wardman, and he asks, is there a limit to the knowledge humans can eventually acquire? If so, what causes us to be limited? Our consciousness, our intelligence, or something else? Um, I take the view that we, we, should, never, um, we should never accept that, that there are limits to, to what we might be able to do. We should always be boldly aspirational, um, and we should believe of ourselves that wherever the frontiers of knowledge lie, we can extend them further. There are people who say, you know, there are certain things, like, for example, consciousness, that we're never going to be able to understand by using consciousness, a bit like the eyeball trying to see itself, but somehow or other, this is just going to be impossible. Well, two things to say about that. But one is that is a very defeatist attitude. And that's why I think we should be aspirational. And the other is there's a kind of, of um, contradiction involved in the idea of limits, which is that you could only really ever identify the limits to knowledge if you could transcend them and look back at them to see where they lie. But then, of course, that's a, you know, that, that's a contradictory notion. So the idea should be keep going. Uh, let us hope that we could reach the truth about things ultimately, even if that is just an ideal of, of inquiry, which we have learned from this very recent experience, is something that may never happen because there will always be new questions, new challenges, new problems. Bill Swanson asks, how would you reform education to achieve the knowledge literacy that you describe? And does a system, the ideal system exist anywhere in the world currently? Well, on the second part of that question, uh, I don't think so. I mean, I think there are some education systems which are a very great deal, uh, which have a great deal to recommend them. Um, Finnish education, for example, has a great deal to recommend it, especially at the primary level, which is very, very important. It's a crucial level, that good platform for uh, getting people uh, to think. You know, in, in our own country, there, there is an organization called the Philosophy Foundation, which goes into primary schools uh, and they take uh, ring donuts with them and they ask the six-year-olds, what happens to the hole in the donut when you've eaten the rest of the donut? And they get these absolutely wonderful answers because kids are great philosophers. They, they really are quite natural at it. And it's that aspect of them, curiosity, inquiry, getting them to think, to ask questions, to be allowed to ask questions. But alas, you know, what we do is, as, as our um, children mature and reach the age of uh, university studies, we have more and more narrowed the curriculum and turned it into a, 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 an exercise of jumping through hoops examination after examination. Now, when, when you're educating on an industrial scale, you tend to start to you know, become very reductive and to use exams and examination results and so on as a way of screening people and, and moving people in one direction rather than another. If I had a magic wand, I would abolish exams altogether because I think they're very artificial and constraining. Any uh, experienced teacher will tell you that you can make very good judgments about people's capacities and interests, indeed more accurate and much fairer and more, more generous to the variety that exists in, you know, in, in human minds and human nature than, than an exam system. And I can tell you just to conclude on this point that I've interviewed students for places at, at university who are obviously so smart that they didn't get a good grade at A-level because the examiner might not have got the point of what they were saying. I mean, that, that does happen. And you can see from that uh, example that there is something that, that in a way oversimplifies matters. And our education system should promote creativity, critical uh, awareness, a real genuine ability to evaluate and to ask questions. And also on the exam question, a lot of people have opinions about this, similar to yours. Sue Kamilabin says, numbers seem to be the new religion. Do you have any thoughts on how to use numbers to be useful and not only to quantify things like mental health and well-being and philosophy? For example, she says that effort by school children is being quantified, which seems unhealthy and inaccurate to her. 
Well, the, 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 um, I mean, one has to acknowledge the fact that uh, the, the tool of mathematics is an extraordinarily powerful one. And it's very, very, very useful, not just in the natural sciences, but also in the social sciences. Very, very useful indeed, uh, uh, you know, statistical trends in society can be of a great value in thinking about public policy matters, for example. But I take your point, uh, I take the point of the question, which is that sometimes if it's simply a matter of assigning uh, um, a, quantity, a quantity to, you know, somebody's um, overall performance or how good somebody is at, at something, there is a danger that you're going to miss things out because you're you're simplifying, you're reducing everything to a, a single um, and a simple metric. So where it matters that there should be something much more nuanced, where we should really spend more time thinking about how we judge a performance or judge a, a person or judge a person's potential, which is the most significant thing in education. Um, we, we should be rather wary about just making everything a matter of percentages and, and uh, grades. We have a question from Will Wyatt, and he asks, if you were able to invest several billion pounds in scientific discovery, which areas would you prioritise? Uh, well, uh, the, the temptation would always be to go for those areas of medical research where there is a kind of you know, epidemic of, of uh, disease, uh, so especially in the cancers and uh, cardiovascular disease. So the temptation would be uh, to do that, uh, especially in the diseases of, of childhood. Um, so what, what one would naturally think of, of putting money there. But if there were enough money going in that direction already, then I, I think the what's sometimes called the blue sky, almost literally so in cosmology uh, and, and, and looking for uh, life elsewhere in the universe, which almost certainly exists. I mean, I know that the real interest is in intelligent life and we have enough of a problem finding that on this planet, let alone elsewhere in the universe. But the very idea of finding life in the universe uh, is a very fascinating one. Statistically, there's probably masses of it. I mean, the most recent uh, investigations of our own solar system suggest that there might very well be life, or at least the, the rich conditions for life, um, on Enceladus, or one of the moons of, uh, of Saturn. So, you know, the, 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 that would be something really well worth doing, because it would be transformative, I think, uh, of, um, for, for, for human beings to know that uh, we're not just alone in this vast, vast universe on, on a rock in a rather ordinary solar system around an ordinary star, but that we have lots of neighbours. That would be nice to know. How would you think that would affect humanity if they realised they perhaps weren't so special as they had assumed? Well, I think it would have a very salutary effect on, on humanity. You know, back in the 16th, 17th century, 17th century especially, people finally came to accept that we weren't the centre of the universe with all the planets and stars orbiting us and that we were the summit and pinnacle of creation and the whole theatre of uh, time, history and the universe was for our benefit. So that put us in our place a little bit. And then Darwin helped uh, to, to give us uh, a, a greater sense of appropriate humility when it turned out that we are primates um, and actually slightly troubling kind of primates in a way because all, all the other um, homo species that existed have vanished um, because of us homo sapiens. And also the 7 billion of us on the planet uh, now have uh, almost eliminated all the other uh, primates as well. The numbers of chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, gibbons is very, very small um, among the ape family. So, you know, we, we are a rather um, troubling uh, species. By the way, this is what raises questions for people who are worried about um, artificial intelligence. If ever it were to reach the level of artificial general intelligence, really, you know, being much, much smarter than human beings, but having something like a, a human type mind because it would almost certainly ask itself the question, what is the most annoying, disruptive and, and damaging thing on the planet? And the answer is, is, of course, human beings. What would it do? Let's see, we don't have to find out too soon. <laughs> um, I have a question from Ronnie Landau, and they ask, why do you think conspiracy theories have such a massive following? Uh, conspiracy theories, um, well, 
Firstly, one must remember that very, very simple theories recommend themselves to people for um, a rather interesting psychological reason, which is that we human beings, we like stories, we like explanations which have a beginning, a middle and an end, and we like closure, we like things to be tied up and signed off, and so we, we have an answer to things. In fact, I sometimes say, much to, to the um, uh, annoyance at any rate of some interlocutors, that you can explain the, the um, major outlook and the, the major uh, tenets of any religion in, in about half an hour or less, whereas it takes a bit longer than that to understand physics. So th this is uh, you know, part of what drives an interest in conspiracy theories, because they tend to be very simplistic. And then they feed something else uh, in our human psyche, which is that they, they uh, reach for the, well, I told you so aspect of us, you know, oh, well, I thought it is the rich or it is the French or it is the something, you know, who are to blame. Uh, and you found somebody to point the finger at. And that has a kind of satisfying aspect to it as well. So alas, uh, conspiracy theories recommend themselves for the kind of reason that Daniel Kahneman pointed out in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow, that, that all of us actually have a propensity to go for the easy answer, the quick answer, the explanation that seems you know uh, plausible because it feeds into some emotional uh, attitude that we have slow thinking as Kahneman describes it is more detailed questioning the right kind of skepticism digging into things a bit and asking whether they really stand up to scrutiny and that is the kind of uh, procedure which of course we want uh, everybody to to um, engage in to deal with the great lavatory war of the internet to deal with conspiracy theories and to deal with this new landscape of inquiry that uh, we've been talking about. We have a question here from an anonymous attendee. They say, thank you for an illuminating lecture and sorry about the smart alike question, but they say you advance a rule of procedure that proposed hypothesis should be defeasible. That rule of procedure seems itself to be a hypothesis about how best to advance the state of knowledge. Is that particular hypothesis defeasible? And what kind of evidence might defeat it? <laughs> well, uh, I, I think one must draw a distinction between um, procedural and methodological principles on the one hand, and what we apply them to. So it, it might be that uh, if you were investigating some natural phenomenon, uh, for, for example, the way that a, a virus mutates, let us say, you, you may set yourself uh, certain parameters of inquiry, certain ways of going about uh, answering questions that you pose about viral mutations. You might say, um, is it a, a function of the number of spikes or is it a you know, is it a matter of the DNA? Is it this or that or the other? So you, you give yourself certain questions that you want to answer and you have to have a clear understanding of what would count as an answer to it. I mean, it's not gonna, the, the fact that your dog has stopped fetching the ball when you throw it, it's got nothing to do with viral mutations one supposes. So you can discount that as uh, you know, part of the evidence and get a clearer conception of what would count as either supporting or infirming uh, an hypothesis. So there's the difference between the metho methodological principles you use and the target of inquiry that you use. So the idea that uh, you should treat all hypotheses about the targets of inquiry as defeasible is not quite the same thing as saying that you should treat all the principles um, of uh, uh, inquiry as being defeasible in the same way. They are defeasible in a rather different way, namely that there might just be very poor principles or there might be ways of applying them uh, more precisely or finely. So you alluded to this particular question a bit earlier, it's from Tony, but they want to know your thoughts about religion and belief and worship of higher beings and how that ties in with knowledge. Well, one very, very interesting thing about the, this new landscape of inquiry and, and how we view the whole process of, of discovery and research is, as I said uh, in, in my presentation, that it comes down to a matter of uh, rationality. Now think about this, think about the word rational. First part of that word is the word ratio, which means proportion. So you, your hypothesis will be uh, accepted and treat it as a premise, a stepping stone for further investigations and further thinking, if it has a very, very high degree of proportionality to the evidence in favor of it. So in a way we're talking about rational belief, belief which is powerfully 
connected to the evidence in its favor and to the arguments that you can give in support of it. So if you think about um, hypothesizing that there are fairies at the bottom of your garden, you will see that the proportion uh, of uh, the evidence and reasons that you have for that uh, and, and the claim itself is extremely low. You could perhaps put it in terms of probability. There's an extremely small probability, so small that to use it as a premise in your thinking and acting would be irrational. Let me give you an example. Um, you, you might think to yourself, well, uh, all our reasoning is probabilistic, it's inductive, so my expectations about the future are always based on the past, but then the future might not wholly resemble the past. So every time I've been in the rain without an umbrella in the past, I've got wet, but maybe the next time it rains, I won't get wet if I don't take an umbrella. So you look out of the window, bucketing down with rain, and you sally forth without an umbrella, what's gonna happen? You're gonna get wet. What are your neighbors gonna think? They're gonna think you're an idiot, you know, because you weren't being rational. You weren't proportioning the evidence that you have to the action or the belief that you take. So it's no longer a question of being certain or of knowing. It's a question of rational commitment, rational acceptance of hypotheses. That's the thing which is so distinctive of science and which is now, of course, general to all our areas of inquiry. Are there instances in which things that seem completely improbable have happened and one has to sort of move away from rationality? Oh, gosh, yes, yes. Well, I could use a very, very topical example, but then I was told uh, um, by, by the BBC earlier today that I mustn't mention Brexit, so I would well, <laughs> there could be plenty of examples of highly improbable things that have happened with awful consequences, uh, and, and some people might think that that's one. But yes, uh, you, you know, when you consider the fact that uh, our expectations about how the world works and how society works and how people will behave, are all, all based on patterns which rely on their predictability. We draw inferences from past experience and from our sets of expectations and our beliefs about things uh, to try to make sense of what's gonna happen next because as you are aware, all our living is about the future even if it's the future of the next second or 10 seconds or minute or something, we're always acting, thinking with future reference. That means that we are heavily reliant upon the past and upon experience and, and upon this network of concepts that we use to guide us in our behavior and our thinking. And when something unexpected uh, happens, we can be very shocked, very surprised, maybe very difficult to understand it because it's so out of, out of the pattern that it's hard to get one's head around it. And these things, of course, do, do happen with uh, sufficient frequency. That is another feature, in fact, of the nature of inquiry that one, if, if one thinks, if one thinks uh, as uh, people do in fundamental physics, that you would not count as a discovery anything that wasn't 99.9% .9 probable, which is what sigma five is, so that's the highest level of, of uh, assurance. Um, the Physics Review uh, Letters is the journal which says it will only treat it as a discovery, something which is uh, at the rate of sig sigma five, 99.9% .9 um, probable. But that means that there is a you know, tiny little probability mm -hmm. that the opposite might happen. And sometimes it does. And one last question, you've had so many, but I'm just gonna end with this. What would you personally most like to find the answer to that you do not already know? Oh, Lord, how does one choose? <laughs> I mean, there, there are so many fascinating um, puzzles about uh, uh, the, the world. But I suppose, you know, if I had a gun to my head and I had to choose one, then it would be about consciousness. It would be about how this extraordinary bit of uh, kit that we've got in our skulls can produce the, the phenomenology of consciousness. The fact that it creates a world. You know, we all think that we look out of windows, double glazed in some cases, at a world arrayed out there in space. But actually, the world as it appears to us in experience is a virtual reality. It's a construct of electrochemical activity, which is happening in this immensely complex thing, about 86 billion neurons with about 100 trillion connections between them, generating a, a, a movie show, you know, a, 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 a cinema show in color with sound, textures, perfumes, and all the rest of it. And it's all happening here, 
what you see is mainly happening in the V1 area of the occipital region of your brain. Uh, and and it's, it's extraordinary. By the way, um, uh, that connects with uh, um, something which I should have mentioned in talking about being literate, if, if I may, uh, Faye. Yes, of course. And that is a, um, a very, very good friend of mine is a, a consultant uh, neurologist. And uh, he had come into his clinic one day in uh, the hospital where he practices in Edinburgh, an elderly gentleman who said to him, I believe that I have had a vascular accident in the occipital, the right occipital region of, of my brain. And my friend thought to himself, hello, somebody been self-diagnosing on the internet again. So he said to him, well, why do you think that? Um, because of course what he was talking about was having had a, a little stroke in the visual center of the, of the occipital region. And this elderly gentleman said, because in my left visual field, I can see human forms floating up out of the floor and passing through the ceiling. Now that phenomenon is diagnostic of a stroke in the visual center of the brain. And when they did a scan, sure enough, there was a blood clot. And when within a few weeks, the blood clot had resolved, these forms had vanished. This gentleman, this elderly gentleman happened to be an emeritus professor from Edinburgh University. So when he saw human figures floating out of the floor, he didn't think that he was being visited by Jesus, Moses and Muhammad. He thought, I've had a stroke. <laughs> and this is a perfect example of how being literate really changes the way you think about the world and how you live your life. That's amazing.